Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Rui Teixeira. Rui, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Brendan. Uh, You know, we've never met before, but I'm happy to meet you virtually and chat about all things political uh, in the United States. Brilliant. I'm delighted to have you on. And there are so many things I want to ask you about. I, I particularly want to dig down with you into the kind of stuff that you write about so brilliantly, which is not just what's happening on the surface of American politics, but also what's happening underneath, uh, especially with all the realignments amongst the electorate themselves, the change in nature of the class vote, the race vote, all that stuff. I really want to get down into the nitty gritty of that rather than just looking at Trump versus Biden once again. Um, Having said that, I do want to kick off by asking you just briefly about the surface appearance of American politics, because to us outsiders, the prospect of another rematch between Trump and Biden, I don't know whether to find it funny or depressing. It does seem uh, a curious prospect to men who are not particularly young fighting it out once again to rule the world. What's your take on the potential that this will be the battle in the presidential election and and what you think it tells us about American politics? Well, I mean, this will be the battle. I think the chances are almost non-existent barring either one of them keeling over, that it won't be Biden versus Trump. I mean, we do have some wild cards here, third party candidates like Kennedy, who may, you know, affect the race, but primarily it's it's Biden versus Trump. And I think it uh, tells us a lot about the sort of uh, unstable uh, equilibrium between the parties where they shift back and forth. Uh, one having an advantage for a while, another having an advantage for a while, but fundamentally not changing very much and not able to really break apart the other's coalition decisively, um, even as there's realignments taking place beneath the surface as the Democrats lose working class voters, uh, but gain uh, more white, you know, college educated suburbanites and all that. The net of this may be enough to reelect Trump. We'll see. But uh, we do have a party on the Republican side that is basically Trumpified and not really capable of making a decisive offer to uh, the American voters, particularly the working class, is li- liable to keep them down on the farm for a long time, but is able to take advantage of the many ways in which they're discontented with the Biden administration. For the Democrats, they seem remarkably like, you know, sort of relaxed about the fact they're losing working class voters left and right. And, you know, they think they can keep their nose above water. They think if they run about abortion and defending democracy, they'll get enough of their voters out to vote that it'll make up for the defections they have among the working class voters. And while there's some recognition in some parts of the Democratic Party that this is not an optimal strategy over the long term, I think they're almost incapable at this point at, at changing course. And because they're not capable of changing course, they wind up essentially using their default option, which is Biden. Um, you know, they, there was no confidence in democratic circles that mattered that if Biden was replaced by X, X would be much better than Biden. I mean, it's hard to replace an incumbent uh, in you know running for reelection. And I think they quite rightly thought most of the people who mattered that you know, would it be better to have Kamala Harris? Would it be better to have Gavin Newsom? Would it be better to have J.B. Pritzker? There's no guarantee an internecine food fight among the Democrats if Biden did step down uh, was going to do much for them. In fact, might put them in a worse position. Um, and very importantly, Biden didn't want to step down. As far as he's concerned, he's tan, rested and ready. You know, I mean, he's made himself, uh, you know, sort of acceptable to almost all elements of the party grudgingly. So uh, he figures he can he can ride this to another glorious four years as president of, of these United States. That's a good jumping off point for some of the things I want to talk to you about. And I really do want to ask you specifically, at least to start off with, um, who the Democrats represent today. Um, because it does seem to me, you've written about this at length, uh, most recently in your book, Where Have All the Democrats Gone? Um, with John B. Judas where you've looked at, I mean, the subheading of that book, The Soul of the Party in the Age of Extremes, really captures some of the themes that you've been thinking about, particularly in relation to the exodus of the white working class and other working class communities um, from the Democratic Party in recent decades. So when you look at the Democratic Party today, the one run by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, you don't see a working class party in the traditional sense, do you? It really has become something else to what it used to be in the past, hasn't it? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, just on the most raw empirical level, um, you know, we saw in 2020 that Biden lost uh, non-college or working class voters, uh, which is very unusual for the Democrats until recently, while carrying college educated voters by quite a bit. And now we're seeing in the polls today that there's been further deterioration of working class support over across races. Uh, for Biden and the Democrats. The typical poll result might be that Biden is down 15 points to Trump among working class voters and up 15 or 20 points among college educated voters. And we're seeing that kind of education polarization, not just among whites, but among other racial groups as well. So uh, just in a raw nose counting sense, the Democrats are no longer the party of the working class. The Republicans really are. Uh, And I think that There's a reason for that. There's a reason. And that's really kind of what John and I talk about in our book um, about how the Democrats lost a lot of white working class voters in the latter part of the 20th century, white working class voters, because of their embrace of a sort of soft neoliberalism. They no longer were convinced these voters, the Democrats were really on their side and could produce prosperity for them. Uh, In fact, they were adopting what a bunch of economists wrote a very interesting paper called the Compensate the Losers strategy. And that did not work well for them in in the late 20th century. And of course, in the 21st century, we've seen the Democrats become increasingly responsive to an ever more important part of their base, which is sort of liberalish, college educated, particularly white voters who are very sensitive and interested in a lot of these social issues that are really totally out of the wheelhouse of uh, most working class voters, uh, including Hispanic working class voters, for example, including black working class voters. I mean, it's kind of weird when you look at the culture of the Democratic Party today and you look at the things they're associated with. And you folks write a lot about this on Spiked. I mean, it's un- unimaginable that the Democratic Party of 30 years ago would have been sort of on board with a lot of the attitudes toward policing, toward uh, gender affirming care toward, you know, relatively open border and porous border, uh, this sort of endless hectoring about racial equity. Uh, this, these are kind of divisive issues that Democrats had enough common sense back in the day, as well as enough anchoring in the working class to avoid. But they are now really are responsive to this huge sector of the party that basically, as I sometimes put it, controls the commanding heights of cultural production. And they're very responsive to that. They need the money. They need the support. Um, This is what people who run the democratic oriented groups, what John and I call the shadow party, the activist organizations and nonprofits, the foundations, huge sectors of academia, huge sectors of the Democratic Party infrastructure itself. This is what they believe in and what they care about. And their culture has basically sort of taken over uh, the Democratic Party in a lot of important ways. Now, Democrats who run in competitive districts, they're not going to run and defund the police. They're not going to run in gender affirming care. But the party is the party. I mean, everything's been nationalized in the United States. The Democratic Party is a certain image. And that image is antithetical to what a lot of working class people are comfortable with. In a way, I mean, you could argue the Democratic Party is it's sort of anti-working class (laughs) in a lot of ways these days. Now, you know, they will always try to argue and it's not crazy that, okay, well, at least we're doing stuff that's in the economic interest of the working class. But in a lot of ways, they really don't like working class people. And those are not the people they feel comfortable with. They're they're like the great unwashed. I mean, you know, John and I put in our book that you kindly mentioned, Brendan, and it's done pretty well, but not as well as it could have, I think, if it had been engaged uh, more directly by a lot of people in the center left. But you know what's getting a lot of engagement on the center left in America today is this new book by this academic and this columnist called White Rural Rage, (laughs) which is basically a book that argues that the reason why rural uh, voters have bailed out of the Democrats is they're the most racist, xenophobic, authoritarian, you know, in short, just complete troglodytes who are opposed to everything decent people could stand for. And this has been hugely popular in Democratic circles. I mean, you know, I just strike my forehead about this. I mean, this is the party of the working class in the United States. And you guys, you actually detest normal people. So I just, it's, sometimes I just can't believe some of the stuff that's happening, but it is. So, I mean, the other part of this, we could talk about it is that they do believe, as I say, that it, whatever the case of these other things may be, they're, they're doing what's in the economic interest of the working class. But I've got some doubts there as well. 
Um, but we can get into that. You know, everything you just said there rings so true to me, not just as uh, someone who observes American politics, albeit from afar, but also someone who observes close up uh, British politics, because the thing that I've been thinking about the Labour left in this country and um, the Labour Party here has gone through some of the similar trends that you describe in relation to the Democratic Party. Um, I see the exact same thing. I used to find myself always saying, well, Labour has turned its back on the working classes. But then I thought, actually, it's a far more active break than that. And Labour now actively dislikes working class communities. It sees them as the term they use here is gammon, which is a reference to the kind of reddened cheeks of the lower middle class voter, especially a middle aged man who is, you know, a bit right wing and possibly likes Nigel Farage and so on. They refer to them as gammon. And of course, gammon is essentially pig meat. It's, it's our version of deplorables. So you kind of see that the kind of center left, the mainstream left, the um, social democratic left, not only turning away from what working class people need and what they think, but also actively positioning themselves against those communities. And I, I did want to ask you um, just whether you would prioritize one trend over another. So in your book, which I agree, more people should have read it and should be talking about it. Um, you basically look at the two different cultural and economic missteps that the Democrats have made. So you've already mentioned that economically from Jimmy Carter through through to Clinton, through to Obama, they ad adopt this kind of soft neoliberalism that many working class communities are not interested in. But also alongside the economic shifts that take place, there are the cultural shifts and the Democrats adopt this kind of cultural radicalism, this kind of what is often referred to as woke politics, kind of the ideology of gender fluidity and critical race theory and other ideas that really turn people off. In terms of the the growing split between the party and workers, do you think one of those is more important than the other? Do you think the economic factor is more important than the cultural factor or vice versa? Or is it a combination of the two that has really convinced people they need to turn their backs on this party? Yeah, I mean, I would I would sort of vote for the combination idea. I mean, I think initially, um, Democrats obviously did push away some voters way back in the day when they were, you know, sort of moved towards civil rights and so on, as particularly in the South, they were going to repel some working class voters. But uh, that lack of economic faith uh, in the Democrats really bit after that and interacted with the initial cultural push away from the Democrats. There's a well-known Gallup question that's been asked for like 75 years about which party will do the best job keeping the country prosperous in the next few years. Democrats used to have huge advantages on this issue, particularly among working class voters. Once you get to the 70s and 80s, that really starts disappearing and it's never come back. And to this day, uh, Democrats are rated below the Republicans uh, on, on which party can keep the country prosperous. So there's that ongoing sense that the Democrats lost their their default advantage on the issue of prosperity for the working class a long time ago. But then you interact that with the way the Democrats didn't just stop at being tolerant. They didn't just stop at being against discrimination. They didn't just stop at equality of opportunity. They went in this bizarre direction in the 21st century, which I don't have to tell you about, Brendan, where you know they went way, way, way over their skis and a lot of boutique kind of academic derived ideas on on how we should all deal with uh, each other, with the so-called marginalized and you know, the ways in which we need reverse discrimination and the ways in which things you thought were true, like there are men and women, that's no longer true. Only dummies believe that. Um, so this immense tolerance and then an active push toward a lot of these cultural ideas. I mean, take immigration, for example. I mean, while you were talking about what's happened in the UK, it, my mind uh, cast itself back to, wasn't it Gordon Brown? He, we said something about this this bigoted woman and how I could barely talk to her or something. What that was sort of an early-ish indicator of what was going to happen to the Labour Party and how they, you know, just really weren't comfortable anymore with the actually existing views of actually existing working class voters. So um, that's really affected the Democratic Party in a big way. But then I think the culturization of a lot of issues in the Democratic Party and of our politics here in the US and the politics on the left has sort of walked that kind of culture into even economic issues. And I think one thing that's really important here is the whole climate issue, which, uh, you know, to the extent that Democrats have an industrial policy and, you know, sort of, I think it's by and large sort of good that they moved in that direction. I'm a 
you know, supporter of at least the idea of industrial policy, but the very way in which the culture of the Democratic Party has evolved has pushed them away from what you might think of as, as a more sensible industrial policy that, you know, tries to sort of prop up competitive industries, give them more running room, uh, and make it easy for them to do stuff and to build stuff, right? I mean, instead, you have this sort of green-oriented, renewables uber alles sort of approach to, you know, let's subsidize renewable energy, let's subsidize electric vehicles, let's get everyone into an EV. Working class people aren't interested in this. They're especially not happy when their energy prices actually go up instead of down, as promised them. So there's a whole aspect to how Democrats now approach economic issues that very much reflects the culture of the party. And that's why, you know, for example, in our book, in this cultural radicalism section, we have a whole chapter on climate and how that evolved from sort of standard environmentalism, let's protect the environment, let's get rid of pollution, and so on, through you know, sort of the whole crusade against nuclear power and then the whole crusade around global warming and moving to renewables as fast as possible. None of this makes a lot of sense, I think, economically and doesn't do a lot for the working class. But I think when your culture of your party is constructed in such a way and the people of influence are those kind of highly educated, liberalish, you know, sort of bien pensant people, uh, that's what they want to do. It's an incredibly important issue for them. I mean, who cares if climate change ranks number 17 in a long list of issues for working class people? We're going to do it anyway, because don't you understand? This is an existential crisis. You know, we should have moved yesterday on this. So I think that that's really screwing up the Democrats' attempt to actually pursue a useful and competitive industrial policy and, and other economic policies in general. They're just so influenced by the way the party's culture has changed that they can't even do that right, which in turn pushes more working class people away and so on and so forth. Hi, it's Brendan here. I just wanted to remind you that you can still buy my book. It's called A Heretic's Manifesto, Essays on the Unsayable. And I've really been blown away by the response to it from readers, reviewers, Spike supporters. People really like this book, and I think you're going to like it too. It covers all the insanities of our time, from climate change hysteria through to COVID authoritarianism, through to the trans ideology. And it basically makes the case for more freedom of speech, more debate, and more heretical thinking to challenge the conformism of our times. So what are you waiting for? Go to Amazon right now and order my book, A Heretic's Manifesto, Essays on the Unsayable. And now on with the show. Yeah, that, that's very well put. And, um, the, you know, the split between these parties and ordinary people on the issue of climate change, it always reminds me of uh, what the Gilets Jaunes protesters in France said, where they essentially said to the elites in Paris, you're obsessed with the end of the world and we're obsessed with the end of the month. And I think that's a good way of understanding it. You know, it has become this very luxuriant culture of fear that you can afford to wrap yourself in if you're already quite wealthy and quite comfortable and you can fantasize that you're saving the planet from doom. But for working people who have to think about paying the bills and being able to drive their car relatively cheaply and hopefully having well-paid uh, jobs in industries, you know, they can't afford to adopt that kind of luxuriant position. I mean, back in the day, social Democrats and center leftists, that's what they cared about. That was our main thing at any rate, right? How are we going to make the lives of working class people better? And that seems to have been lost in the shuffle here. It seems so long ago. But I think you're, you're right to, uh, and you do it in the book as well, as you say, you're right to raise the issue of climate change, because I think it is growing in importance. And it does really represent almost an intersection between those two trends that you identify, you know, on the one hand, the economic uh, shifts in the Democratic Party and other left wing institutions, and on the other hand, the cultural shift, and there's an unholy marriage of those two things on the green issue, which combines both, you know, economic stupidity and cultural fanaticism, and you end up with climate change alarmism that might benefit sections of the ruling class, but it doesn't benefit the working class. Um, I did want to ask you in relation to uh, that particular question and the economic side of it, you talk in the book and you've talked elsewhere as well about uh, the Democrats move towards a kind of soft neoliberalism. Again, we've seen a similar thing in the UK. I mean, most famously with Tony Blair, who rewrote the Labour Party's constitution to remove the explicit references to workers' control over the economy and to shift Labour towards something that was much more 
politically centrist and economically neoliberal. You know, people often refer to it as a continuation of Thatcherism, but a bit nicer, not not as mean as as Margaret Thatcher was. Um, what do you think the shift towards neoliberalism tells us about these supposedly left or labour leaning institutions more broadly? Is it that the working classes became weaker as a constituency in society and therefore the parties felt they could drift off into new economic arenas? Or is it that, you know, the parties themselves reject the idea of a more kind of state-based or worker-based industrial policy and prefer to uh, move into the more free market arena? How, How do you explain the dynamic of these parties shifting in the way that you describe in those economic terms? Well, at least in the United States, I do think that a, that a key part of how the party evolved was, on the one hand, uh, the sort of just flat out declining weight of the labor movement in the Democratic Party. Uh, the labor movement really declined pretty drastically in the latter part of the 20th century. There were just fewer people in unions. They had less political power. That affected the culture of the party. It affected how people thought about the world and thought about politics who were running the Democratic Party because they didn't have nearly as much pressure from the unions and the the culture that uh, sort of corresponded to the unions when they made their decisions about what to do. You could see that in how they evolved in the immigration issue um, and lots of other things as well. So there's that. And then on the other hand, it was the case that Democrats started doing steadily better among the burgeoning college-educated part of the population. In other words, it wasn't just that they were moving away from the working class, they were responding to some extent from signals they were receiving from another part of the electorate, which was interested in at least some of what Democrats stood for, even if the sort of economic, social democratic thing they were less interested in. But they liked what Democrats stood for in terms of some of these social issues. And Democrats were getting increasing support from those voters. And of course, those voters have money, those voters have influence, those voters could help the Democratic Party uh, get at least to, to what at that point they thought they wanted to go. So, so I think both things are happening, that the college educated, more affluent part of the population becomes more important, becomes more democratic on the one hand, and the working class just flat out loses power. Uh, and its influence over the Democratic Party. It didn't anchor the Democratic Party anymore. I mean, one reason why the Democrats didn't adopt completely crazy positions, uh, you know, in in most of the 20th century, is because the kind of people running the party were relatively closely connected to the labor movement and those kinds of communities and realized this would be friggin' crazy for us to, to move too fast on this stuff. I mean, their culture is not my culture. I mean, David Shore, the American analyst and data guy has pointed out, I mean, back in the day, a long time ago, like what, five, 10% of the United States had a college degree. And the kind of people running the Democratic Party were aware of that. And they may have had quite liberal views on a lot of cultural issues, but they knew they couldn't impose that on their party and on the working class. Well, that that ship has sailed. Now they feel they can impose their cultural views on, on the party and the working class. And by God, they're going to do it. Absolutely. Um, I want to ask you about the changing nature of the way in which minorities are voting or thinking about voting in the US. Because what's interesting about the work that you've done over the past couple of decades or longer, uh, especially the work you've done with Judas, you did a book with him around 20 years ago on the emerging democratic majority, which just looked at the idea that the Democratic Party, through securing the support of this emerging graduate elite, the kind of uh, movers and shakers in in the political class and the media class and those kind of upper classes, securing their support and also really firming up support among minority communities as well, that through that they might be able to secure a longer term grip on power or certainly get more power uh, in the long run. Um, you're now pushing back on some of your own arguments, or at least updating them, because one of the things obviously that has happened is that, as you say, the Democrats have not only lost support amongst white working class voters, but also amongst non-white working class voters. So we've seen that, for example, uh, Republican support among Hispanic voters has gone up by about 10 points, I think, since 2018. And in 2020, uh, Donald Trump uh, increased his share of the Latino vote quite significantly, Uh, I think he got the highest Latino vote since um, George W. Bush. How worrying do you think that is for the Democratic establishment? This creeping realisation, I presume, that they can't even rely on the support of minority communities because 
they're being drawn to the Republican side in the same way, I guess, that many white working class voters already have been. Yeah, no, that's huge. And, and they're still in denial, I think, to, to a large extent about this. When we wrote the Emerging Democratic Majority in 2002, Judas and I, we were basically looking at the way the terrain, underlying terrain of American politics was changing, about the rise and shifts among professionals, uh, the changing nature of the women's vote, obviously the rising share of the minority vote, uh, the ways in which the more dynamic parts of the country seem to be moving toward the Democrats and those putting more states in play. Um, and our theory was that if you could keep on the white working class side, that you could actually parlay this into a period of political dominance if you didn't get too far out over your skis on, on some of these other issues. Um, but the, the latter part of that, the idea the Democrats needed to retain a strong share, if not a majority of the white working class vote, maybe 40% nationally, 45% in a lot of key Rust Belt states, that was widely ignored. I mean, people immediately forgot what we said. <laughs> they just liked the part about, oh, all these groups are growing and they're going to uh, support the Democrats. So this is great. You know, we, we got it locked. Um, and then in 2008, when Obama wins his, his uh, thumping victory, um, people treated us as prophets. You know, we'd figured it out in advance. But, uh, you know, that didn't last very long, as you know. In 2010, the Democrats got crushed, lost 63 seats, particularly because white working class voters bailed out of them en masse. 2012, Obama manages to get another term, but he does this a lot. And again, widely misunderstood because he brought a lot of white working class voters back in the upper Midwest. 2014, another bad election and that for the Democrats, and that brings us to 2016. So as John and I were watching this, we were very aware that the Achilles heel that we'd identified in the book, which had been ignored, was actually happening. They really were having too much leakage in that sector of the electorate to, to have a dominant electoral coalition. I mean, one of the interesting things is after 2012, when Obama won, um, basically that was interpreted in Democratic circles and even in Republican circles as indicating the strength of the rising American electorate, the coalition of the ascendant, whereas actually it, that wasn't quite what it was about because it was so intimately linked to Obama's ability to actually attract some more white working class voters. And after 2016, of course, it's Katie bar the door in terms of interpretations. I mean, this is the deplorables coming home to roost as far as most Democrats were concerned. I mean, no one could possibly vote for Trump unless they were xenophobic, racist, and a variety of other phobias and, and isms. So um, particularly after that, John and I realized, look, this whole thing is going south on the Democrats. Uh, and, you know, they are kidding themselves that the nature of the minority vote is so large uh, and so solid that, that nothing will ever change on that. And they'll be able to overcome all their problems by simply mobilizing their own voters more, more adeptly and more vigorously. And then we get to 2020. And while Biden does squeak out a victory, we see exactly what you were alluding to earlier, Brendan a mass bailout among particularly Hispanic working class voters. Democrats' advantage among these voters probably declined by about 20 points between 2016 and 2020. This was with Donald Trump, the guy everybody was supposed to hate because he's such a racist. So, and we've, we've just seen that story continue since 2020. Democrats are doing progressively worse with non-white working class voters. Just as an example, one of my favorite little data points, Barack Obama, in 2012, carried non-white working class voters by 67 points. Uh, Biden carried them by 48 points in 2020. And in recent polls, you know, it's like in the last New York Times poll, uh, Biden was carrying non-white work, non working class voters by six points over Donald Trump. And you just see this in poll after poll. Non-white working class voters are now moving in the direction consistent with what's happened with white working class voters, albeit from a much you know, higher baseline, right? They still support the Democrats, but those margins are just dropping precipitously. And that, that's huge because the whole theory of the case that Democrats have been basing their politics on starts going away if you start losing that much support among minority working class voters. It just doesn't work as political arithmetic. Um, you know, your theory that you can compensate for losses among the white working class by, you know, these super high levels of support in the rest of the electorate is no longer true because they're doing the same thing. They're moving in the same direction. So uh, this is kind of where we, we are today. And as 
as I mentioned, uh, you know, sort of at the top of these these remarks, I mean, Democrats, they can't quite believe it. I mean, they'd rather believe anything than it's really happening. And they're not really willing to take much of a course correction because of it. They assume these voters will come home. They'll realize how awful Trump is and how great the Democrats are and how wonderful the economy is. And eventually, you know, everything will turn out all right. But but I just think this is like kind of, uh, can I say this, a big fucking deal, <laughs> as Joe Biden once put it about, uh, you know, the Obamacare uh, bill. You absolutely can say that. And, and it's a very apt way of putting it. Um, I think there's something about the shifting in the Hispanic vote in particular over the past decade or so that I actually find quite heartening because one of the things that does tick me off about this new left or this kind of new establishment approach, which is so dismissive of working class communities and their economic concerns and their cultural beliefs and so on, is that there is this presumption that the minorities will always come back home for dinner, right? So even if we spend four years in between elections doing crazy things economically and culturally and politically, these good little minorities will always come back and boost us in the ballot box. And there's there's a kind of imperious tone often to, to that presumption that these people will support us. I remember that people used to say here in the UK that you could put a red rosette on a donkey and people would vote for it. You know, uh, the red rosette in this case representing the Labour Party. There was always that presumption, you know, the working classes, even if you treat them really badly, they'll vote for us. That's what they do. And they've stopped doing it, you know, particularly in the 2019 general election when vast, vast numbers of working class voters abandoned Labour and, and went for Boris Johnson and his promise to get Brexit done. So I find it quite heartening sometimes, even though it throws politics in the air and creates the space sometimes for, I don't know, problematic right wing forces potentially. I think there is something quite heartening when voters don't do what they're told to do and instead think to themselves, well, what's in my best interest and the best interest of my community? When a huge mistake I thought the Democrats made, and it sort of goes along with this whole racial reckoning and racial equity kind of thing, which took hold of the Democrats in the teens, um, they made a big mistake starting to refer to Hispanics as people of color. You know, people of color who live in this benighted racist society we call America who struggle every day with microaggressions and there's sort of the dead weight of a racist system on their backs. And that's really what they're about. They're just like all the other non-whites. You know, they, they want to struggle against racism and that's really their concern. And if they're concerned with an issue, it must be immigration because immigration is their brothers and sisters in the South who want to come here and you know, are sort of going to wind up in this racist society, um, so on and so forth. Now, none of this was true. Because that's not a way Hispanics look at the world, right? These are upwardly mobile, patriotic voters who are mostly concerned with their community, with their families, with uh, issues around uh, crime and public safety, and, and just like the quality of life, right? They want to lead a good, decent life, and they want to be upwardly mobile. And to the extent they believe Democrats were more on their side than the Republicans, that was going to keep them on a Democrat side, right? I mean, we're immigrants. We came to the United States. The Democrats seem to be better for us than the other side in terms of the things we need and want. But once you start putting them in that bucket of oppressed people of color, you know, they, they don't get it. That's not the way they think about the world. That's not what they want out of the world. That's not what they want out of America. <laughs> they like America. <laughs> they don't hate it. You know, they don't think it's like, you know, it's this dystopian hellhole. So Democrats really started to lose Hispanics, I think, with that kind of attitude. And they really took their eye off the ball in terms of what these constituencies are really wanted and, you know, sort of way over indexed on the immigration issue. Because for a lot of these voters, that wasn't their main issue at all. You know, and a lot of these voters don't even like legal immigration and don't think the border should be open. I mean, these are citizens. They've been here for a while, most of them. So so it's just a massive mistake. And it just shows the, the kind of ideological blinders that so many people in the Democratic Party started putting on, particularly in the teens and, and sort of up to the current day, I think. Um, we could see that in immigration debates really just at the current time. So, you know, this this is really remarkable. And they really need to get back to thinking about Hispanics as what they are, an upwardly mobile working class community who wants a better life. And if they did that, they'd probably do better among these voters and stem some of the bleeding. Following on from that, do you think that there are still, I'm sure there are still elements in the Democratic Party that 
undermine the impact of the other side of this equation, which is the cultural radicalism. So, you know, we've touched on some of the economic shifts and and why they might be problematic. Uh, And we've touched on the cultural side to it too. But I want to ask you if you think there are still elements within the party, especially the upper echelons of the party, that undermine the impact that their embrace of this so-called progressive radicalism is having. So if you think about you know, the uh, idea of critical race theory, um, some of the transgender ideas, particularly the notion of, you know, transing young children or giving drugs to young children, you know, right through to, as you've just mentioned there, a kind of anti-Americanism, you know, the whole idea that America is a has racism ingrained into it and will never recover from the original sin of slavery or the original sin of, you know, the genocide against the Native Americans or whatever else it might be. Um, there is this kind of relentless cultural crusade against the idea of America, against the idea even of biological sex, against the idea of um, the family, tradition, even policing, as, as you say, you know, defund the police became a rallying cry, at least among sections of the kind of activist wing of the Democratic Party. But the party seems not to, I think, understand or recognise how negative all of that sounds to many voters, including white working class voters, Latino voters, black voters. Do you think they underestimate the impact that their cultural radicalism is having on their ability to win support from working class voters? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, the standard reply to some of what you said, Brendan, and, and what I'd say Yes, well, okay. There might be, you know, I mean, it's, I guess to some, if some people would just defend all these ideas as great, but even the people that don't think they're great, it's like, oh, okay. I mean, some people say that, but you know, people don't run on that. Nobody in a competitive district runs on defunding the police or gender affirming care or what have you or transing children. So it's just irrelevant. I mean, yeah, people are going to say what they're going to say, but it doesn't really hurt the Democrats, which I think is ludicrous. Parties are incredibly affected by their cultural tone, by how they're covered in the media, by what people hear about them, by their overall image. And their overall image of the Democrats is very much caught up with all these kinds of things. And one reason why it's caught up in all these kinds of things is not because, though Biden does say some crazy things, for example, uh, though he doesn't give a lot of talks on the beauties of gender affirming care, uh, you know, his party is caught up in all that stuff. And one thing voters notice is there's never any attempt to really dissociate the party from those kinds of ideas. Look at the uh, the crime stuff, right? You were just mentioning that. Yeah, people don't run and defund the police, but people have noticed there were Democrats run the administrations, the cities. They say they're very circumspect about heavy enforcement of the law. They're they're not tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. They're kind of like really, really walking on eggs in terms of how much and how heavily they enforce the law. And their number one priority does not appear to be clean up the streets to get open drug taking off the streets. And just generally, there's an enormous amount of care put into sort of not being too too not nice to criminals, right? I mean, what people really want is public safety and clean streets, right? That's what they want. And the Democrats have not been able to deliver that. And they haven't been willing to draw the lines against people who are associated with the Democrats who do and say crazy things or practice policies that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. So that is what they're failing to do. They're not willing to really clarify the image of the party on a lot of these issues about immigration, about crime, about race, about gender. They're not willing to like basically say, we are the common sense party. Here's what we believe. We don't believe in discriminating against anybody. We don't believe in cruelty. But on the other hand, you know, the border needs to be secure. On the other hand, you got to put the violent criminals in jail. You know, on the other hand, biological sex is real. You know, kids should not sort of necessarily be prescribed puberty blockers like uh, candy. Um, There's really almost none of that. And it goes straight up to the top of the Democratic Party, up to Biden, up to Schumer, the people running the party, the sort of culture of the party. Nobody's willing to get out there and draw a line and say, you know, these people are friggin' crazy and they don't represent what Democrats are all about. And my view is until and unless they're willing to make some concerted efforts along those lines, uh, people will continue to draw the obvious conclusions, which is Democrats are, that's kind of where they're coming from. That's the party they are. Yeah, uh, I, I did want to ask you, in fact, specifically about the crime 
question because I find this very interesting in the American discussion about it and also the British discussion as well, because I think it, it seems increasingly clear that the Democratic Party and the Labour Party underestimate the importance of everyday security to working people. And, you know, there is this tendency to look down upon anyone who's concerned about uh, antisocial behaviour or criminal behaviour or gangs hanging around on street corners or uh, teenagers on public transport being rude and playing their music out loud, whatever it might be from, you know, the, the trivial to the much more serious. Anyone who's concerned about that stuff, there's a tendency to look down upon them as reactionary, you know, secretly a bit racist and, and you know, as law and order authoritarians, you know, the kind of people who want to stamp a Norwellian boot across society and destroy freedom entirely. But in fact, it's not like that, is it? I mean, even Slavoj Žižek made this point fairly recently where he said what much of the modern left doesn't understand is that the reason crime is such a domain of dissatisfaction for ordinary voters is because everyday insecurity tends to hurt poor people far more than wealthier people who tend to live either in gated communities or certainly in wealthy suburbs or nice areas that don't have the same problems. So do you think that the crime question and the Democrats' inability to understand why working people might be worried about it, it speaks to their increasing distance from normal life and from normal people? And I guess the more gated they become the less sensitive they become to what normal people want and, and think. The fact of the matter is, and even a small grain of common sense and connection to reality would, would make this clear to you, ordinary people hate crime. They really hate it. They really hate having to worry about it. Of course, they really hate it when it happens. I mean, this is incredibly important. If you can't convince people you can provide public safety, you've already got two strikes and you haven't even come up the bat. So the amazing tendency of a lot of Democrats to, to respond to like complaints about crime, which is, this is, I, I call it sometimes the Fox News fallacy. Well, Fox News is talking about crime, then it can't possibly be a real issue. But they're talking about it because it's an actual concern of actual voters and it's actually happening. Um, instead, what Democrats tend to offer, and we've seen this a lot lately in, in the states, is like, okay, well, but look, look at the latest crime stats. Crime has gone down in, you know, 32 of, uh, you know, 47 cities. Uh, you know, th this crime has gone down. That crime hasn't gone up lately. Uh, they basically offer statistics instead of assurance they're actually going to do something about it. And I just think this is a huge mistake. Voters hate crime because crime is really bad. <laughs> and uh, unless you can convince them you could do something about it, you're not going to win that argument. You're just not. Yeah. Uh, it's extraordinary when you hear, um, you know, I know there's a, a tendency among some activists in America to say, you know, relax about shoplifting. It's not the end of the world. And there's a very similar discussion, uh, or there has been over the past few years in the UK about, you know, should we really punish shoplifters? Is it really that grave a crime? And again, it all tends to come from people who live in a certain section of society, a much more comfortable section of society, who don't understand not only that people don't like to see things being stolen from their local shop, but also they don't like the culture that goes along with that, which is the idea that, you know, there's no order, there's no need for decency, there's no need for honesty in society. Who cares if, if someone takes a loaf of bread? It's fine. It's not a problem. And, and they don't understand, I think, the broad... Maybe they were hungry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, no, social disorder. Social disorder, Brendan. When you're the party of social disorder, and increasingly I think the left parties are more associated with, this is not a good look. I mean, people really do want social order. It doesn't mean they want fascism, but they do want, you know, a society where, where there's some sort of real order in everyday life. Uh, and if you forget about that, I just think you're, again, you're divorcing yourself from the way ordinary people look at the world, it's particularly ordinary working class people, which gets back to our whole discussion about how insulated these uh, liberalish educated elites are now from everyday voters. If you're a regular listener to this show or a regular reader of Spiked, why not become a Spiked supporter? Spiked Supporters is our thriving community of people who donate to Spiked. Anyone who gives £5 or more a month or £50 or more a year can become a Spiked supporter and get access to lots of exciting perks. Spiked supporters can comment on articles, get free and discounted tickets to events, get a discount on all items in our shop and bookmark articles as you browse. 
This is our way of saying thank you to all of you who fund our work. Spiked is completely free, and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to make sure that anyone, anywhere can read us and listen to us. We're incredibly grateful for your generosity. If you don't give to Spiked yet, now is the perfect time to start. Just go to spiked-online.com slash supporters to set up your donation and your Spike supporters account. That's spiked-online.com slash supporters. I just wanted to ask you about a couple of things um, that seem fairly specific to the US at the moment, or certainly they're blowing up there more than they are elsewhere right now. The first one is in relation to education and schools and um what looks like a growing revolt or a simmering revolt amongst parents against the teaching of crazy nonsense to their children, to put it bluntly, uh, you know, whether it's elements of the critical race theory that might sneak into the curriculum, if not in that language, or um, gender ideology, the encouragement of kids to maybe even, you know, play act at the opposite gender while they're at school. We have some of these discussions in the UK as well. And the question here is always, well, uh, should the parents be informed? Should the parents be drawn into this discussion? And very often it's just no. Leave the parents out of it and let the schools decide what children should think about race, what they should think about gender, what they should think about history, their relationship to society. There's this continual exclusion of supposedly problematic parents and the state instead uh, gives itself the responsibility to inculcate the next generation with what it considers to be the correct thinking on all those issues. And that's really blown up in the US as well. There seems to be a lot of pushback. Is that ongoing, do you think? Is there is there legs in the kind of parental revolt against some of this stuff? Well, there's definitely uh, increasing pushback. Uh, you know, obviously, this stuff has spread pretty far in the United States. I mean, it's in a ton of school districts, affects tens of millions of children. And there is a lot of pushback, but there are some things that have really undermined that pushback. And it's not public opinion, right? I mean, if you ask people about things like, should parents be told if their their, their kids adopt a different gender or name at school? It's like, yeah, they should probably be told. But, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and other stuff, do you think, uh, you know, biological boys should play at girls' teams? Do you think that people should be separated by race into affinity groups at school? None of this stuff has much support. But the problem is that when it comes to local schools and activism around local schools and elections to school boards and things like that, basically the super liberal side of this punches way above its weight, right? These are the most educated, active, engaged citizens in their area, typically. And they're actually able in low turnout elections to overwhelm the other side, even when there's a lot of public sentiment uh, that supports the other side, that wants you know, sort of more reasonable approach to what people learn in school. So, so this is to the disadvantage. I mean, in a way, one, one way we put it in the United States these days is the Democrats have become low turnout election specialists. <laughs> they've, they've got all the highly educated, liberalish engaged people, and they'll show up for anything, um, particularly, you know, a school board that's going to election where it's going to determine whether their kids learn about groovy things like trans ideology. Um, so this undercuts the sort of more working class, ordinary citizen oriented pushback against this. I mean, you would think this would be a relatively easy thing for the Democrats to get on the right side of. Just say, let's get ideology out of the schools, left or right. It has no place in schools. We want people to learn stuff. We want them to learn math and reading, and we want them to, to learn what they need to prosper in life, and the rest of it is, is baloney. But that's totally not where the Democrats come from these days. I mean, they're very influenced by all these weird pedagogical theories, by the teachers' unions, by the most liberal elements of their, their constituency, for whom a lot of this stuff is, is just fine, you know? And the education bureaucracy the superintendents, the education schools, they all believe in this, this lunacy. Um, and it filters down and it has very much of an effect on ordinary students because a lot of these bureaucracies are not responsive to democratic pressure in many ways. This will take some time to really have a successful pushback against it uh, for some of the reasons I, I outlined. But I think in terms of the views of ordinary voters and ordinary parents, there's a lot of leeriness and, and pushback about this. And because we probably passed peak woke in terms of the lives of ordinary citizens a few years ago, so people are a little bit more willing to speak out against insanity 
but it's still hard for a lot of people. And it's still hard to translate that willingness to speak up against woke nonsense, as it were, into actually changing what's happening, for example, in your local school. That's, that's a much heavier lift. Yeah, absolutely. The, the other thing I wanted to touch on with you in relation to the Democratic Party is the, uh, this is a huge issue, which, which is its own podcast, but I did want to ask your opinion on the Israel Hamas question, the Israel Gaza question, because, you know, um, I read all the time that the Gaza war, the Gaza crisis has driven a wedge in the Democratic Party. It's caused these huge fissures. It does seem to me that some of the policies that the Biden administration is now adopting, which, you know, for example, abstaining on a recent um, ceasefire motion at the United Nations, which really ticked off Israel, um, it does seem that that might be motivated by a desire amongst the Biden administration not to lose the voices within its party who are more concerned about something like the Gaza situation. And, and I'm assuming, I may be wrong, but I'm assuming that a lot of them are maybe the activist wing, the graduate wing, those who are embroiled in that anti-Israel politics. There's a similar dynamic in the UK where the Labour Party here is in something of a turmoil over the Gaza situation, and it potentially will lose a lot of Muslim voters, but also a lot of upper middle class voters who are now saying, we're going to vote green, we're going to abandon the party, we can't believe you're supporting what they refer to as a genocide. Um, how big is that issue? How big is that question? And is there not any element in the Democratic Party that was shocked by how some people on the left responded to the 7th of October attack? You know, we all saw those ugly scenes of uh, young activists, in some cases, even celebrating it or certainly making excuses for it. How are the Democrats relating to all of that stuff? Well, I, I, I think you're right that the Biden administration has been taking some of the moves it has in response to, you know, pressure within the party, the perceived preferences of people who they think are part of their base. I mean, my view is that obviously there is a lot of dissatisfaction. The extrapolation of that dissatisfaction to large numbers of voters is somewhat suspect. I mean, this is clearly coming from the activist contingent and some of the campuses. Uh, that's where the real you know, sort of energy is. And those people, they just don't represent that many voters. So the idea that unless uh, Biden is administration is extremely responsive to these kinds of voters, that uh, it's going to put a big dent in their political coalition, I think it's probably exaggerated. Um, you know, but I think partly what it reflects is sort of interesting here is it get, all gets back to what John and I talked about in our book about the shadow party. Because one thing about the shadow party is all these issues have become mushed together. You know, issues of racism, issues of law and order, issues of immigration, issues of climate, and, you know, and hey, free Palestine. Now that's part of the, the this sort of blob of progressive positions that everyone in the groups and in the activist left and in the more liberal elements of the party feels they have to subscribe to, right? It's all fits together into one massive progressive commitment. But that's not the way ordinary voters, including ordinary democratic voters, look at the world. They're, they're, they're much more fractionated in terms of that set of preferences. And the idea that they feel as strongly about this as some of the people out there, you know, disrupting Biden and Kamala Harris speeches by, you know, denouncing genocide Joe. I mean, I think that that's easy to exaggerate. But, uh, you know, just because it's a, in a sense a fight among uh, activists and, uh, you know, sort of reflects fissures in the elite doesn't mean it's not important because that does affect, you know, the policies that Biden administration has, does affect the image of the party. You know, it can't be good for the party that all these nuts are, are, are disrupting the, the main democratic politicians whenever they make a speech. It's not a good look for a political party uh, that wants to beat Donald Trump. So uh, I don't want to underplay uh, the significance of it, but I do think there are questions about whether this represents a you know sort of seismic electoral movement among large sections of the population, it really is, you know, sort of more complicated than that, and and more specific to the way the Democratic Party is structured and to whom they they feel they currently have to respond. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, this brings me on to my final question. That I want to ask you. You mentioned there the Shadow Party, and um, that's one of the really well put themes in your book. You know, the Shadow Party being the kind of uh, advocacy groups and think tanks and activist groups 
and sections of the liberal media as well. And, and you and Judas argue that it's this shadow party that's pushing the party, the Democrats, um, increasingly towards these policies that working class voters think are a bit crazy and stupid and, and not worth voting for. So that does bring me on to my final question, which is, what happens to the party next? So what happens to the party when Joe Biden goes? Um, isn't it just the case that the shadow party then becomes the party and they, they get moulded together in an inseparable way? Because the way I think about Joe Biden, even though I don't think he's particularly interesting or a very good president, uh, I think about him in some ways similarly to Bernie Sanders in the sense that they are two old geezers who still have some understanding, I think, at some level, that there are working people out there who have certain needs and interests. And they may not, uh, especially Biden, they may not give voice to those concerns very well or represent them, but they have an understanding that those communities exist. And at some point, at least in the past, they had a connection with those communities. So it seems that when Biden goes... And when the uh, Bernie Sanders train runs out of steam, which seems that that will happen, I don't know, fairly soon, um, what happens next? You know, is it, it will it be Kamala Harris's party? Will it be just completely the party of the woke upper classes? Is there hope for the Democratic Party, I guess is what I'm asking you, or is it a lost cause? Well, I wouldn't say it's a lost cause, but I do think there are some reasons for concern. Uh, Biden has managed to uh, uh, sort of be a, a peacemaking figure, you know, in the currently existing Democratic Party. He's able to keep the people on the, you know, liberal, you know, sort of wokish left pretty happy and some of the more moderate people happy. He's he's basically a guy who doesn't want to make waves. He wants to cleave to what he perceives to be the center of gravity of the party. And he does have these instincts that go back decades in terms of the formerly existing Democratic Party and its relationship to ordinary working class voters. Uh, yeah, but once he's off the scene, you know, what does happen? I mean, I, I think basically there's big elements of the party of the so-called progressive left who basically think after Biden, our turn, right? So if, in fact, Kamala Harris is able to become a, the leading figure of the party or some of these other people are waiting in the wings, that means one thing. But it's not like the other elements of the party will necessarily give up. There are going to be people who are going to try to have a more moderate and less, you know, explicitly super liberal approach. I mean, people like Josh Shapiro and Jared Polis. And, you know, I'm not so sure about Gretchen Whitmer, actually. But there's a lot of Democrats out there who who may realize that, you know, the party needs a, a closer connection to working class voters and can't be so ID'd by a lot of these ultra left positions. That that's really not good. And we can't just rely on college educated voters to put us over the top all the time. So, I mean, that's, that's the ray of hope there, I suppose that, you know, parties respond to market signals. And if they feel they're losing ground because of their current strategy, they may in fact change it. Look, I mean, what if Biden loses? It could easily happen. You know, shouldn't that lead to some rethinking about the party's uh, evolution in the last decade or so? One would hope, but I do think there's big elements of the party that win or lose will basically try to make the shadow party the party, because that corresponds with their preferences about the world and what they really want to accomplish. And they could give a good gosh darn about the working class, or at least their preferences. So um, as I say, there are reasons for concern, but I would, I would give up yet. Rui, thank you very much. Hey, thank you.